Hi everybody, this is Mr. Burke. I'm here with part two of 11.2 movement for higher level IB biology. We're about to start diving into what muscles actually are. Okay, so before we had reviewed the general structure of an antagonistic pair of muscles in our arm, our forearm and our upper arm, and talked about joints a little bit as well. We talked about how ligaments and tendons help us to move. Ligaments, of course, are connecting bone to bone. And then the tendons are connecting muscle to bone. Okay, now what actually is allowing for muscles to contract? You've heard this word before. You know that muscles do contract and relax. Right? You've heard of that in inspiration and expiration as well. But how do they actually do that? So now we're getting into those specifics. And in order to get into that, you do need to know some additional vocabulary surrounding the muscle cell. Okay, we say that the muscle cells are striated because they have dark and light bands and contract longitudinally. Okay, we've got these structures called myofibril. So this whole image right here is a cross section of one muscle cell. It might look like multiple cells and structures going on here. There are multiple structures, but this is one cell. Okay, and as you can see, there are some things you might recognize, right? Like a capillary surrounding the cell. You might recognize these mitochondria here, which are needed to provide a lot of energy to the muscle cells, because you know that that's one of the specializations of muscle cells, is they need a lot of mitochondria to provide energy for the action that they do, right? For the contraction, okay? That allows us to move. And then you're seeing some other newer vocab. Oh, you can see no nuclei there too, nucleus. Um, but you'll notice that there are these things called myofibrils, okay? These are the rod-shaped contractile units, right, inside of the muscle cells, okay? So we can see one, two, three, four, five of them right here inside of this one muscle cell. These are the things that are actually contracting inside of a muscle cell, okay? We can call the single muscle cell a muscle fiber. As we move on, you can see that there's another specialized structure called the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So this is actually a modified endoplasmic reticulum. If you can remember back to the unit in cells about endoplasmic reticulums. So this is a modified version of that, more specialized for muscle cells. And it is used to store calcium ions, okay? Remember that ER, the normal ER, or endoplasmic reticulum, actually synthesizes molecules, but that is not the case for sarcoplasmic reticulum, this yellow, webby-looking structure there. They're storing the calcium ions, and that does become important in understanding the whole process and all of the steps involved with contraction. Okay, and then you'll see they are multinucleated, so they do have multiple nuclei inside of these cells. That just helps with protein production and communication within the cell. Okay, mitochondria are present, as we were saying, due to this high demand for ATP. Okay, now just one more structure here that you need to know, and this is the smallest structure and quite possibly the most important one to know. Each of those myofibrils that we talked about inside of the cells are made up of contractile units called sarcomeres, okay? So what are these sarcomeres? So you can see at the end of this myofibril right here, you can see there's one unit right here of a sarcomere, there's another unit right here of a sarcomere, and then another one here, and so on, and it keeps repeating throughout the myofibril. So each of these is what's involved with the actual mechanisms behind at the molecular and cellular level behind how do these muscles contract okay that's the question we're trying to think about and answer as we learn about this and so these sarcomeres as you can see in this diagram right here 
They are composed of myosin, that's the reddish, thicker part of the sarcomere, and then the actin, that's shown in blue here, and that's, those are thinner parts of the structure of the sarcomere, okay? And then they also divide these up into these different bands right here. Okay, you don't need to know so much about the M line. I would know what the Z line is. So the Z line is where the actin, it's like the end of the actin, it's the end of either side of the sarcomere, okay? And the actin structure that's right there. Okay, you, here's a closer up image of that sarcomere. So the Z line, again, are either end of the sarcomere, and they're denoted by darker bands, okay, right there, surrounded by a wider, lighter band, okay? Okay, so if you zoom in further on the sarcomere with these thin actin filaments and the thicker myosin filaments, you would see this, something like this. So there was the Z line, which is like the end of the sarcomere structure, the unit, okay? You can see the thin actin coming out here, thin actin structure. And then you can see that there's the thicker myosin and there's this thing called a myosin head that comes out and it does bind to the actin, okay? And that's what's involved with this contraction that happens. The myosin head goes, retracts out, binds to the actin, and actually th kind of throws the actin inward, okay? So that the sarcomere then shortens, and that's contraction. That's how these muscles are contracting, and that's why the muscles, when, they're, when they are contracted, they get shorter, right? And maybe wider and bulge out a little bit. Okay, now we're going, and then when the sarcomere does contract, you'll notice that there's a change that happens here in the structure because the actin comes in, and then the way that we see that is actually over here, we can see this on a micrograph, electron micrograph, that when it's fully contracted, and you do need to recognize this because it says analysis of electron micrographs to find the state of contraction of the muscle fibers, you need to know that when it's shorter and the Z lines and Z bands have come together, okay, and gotten closer to these H bands, that's the ones that are in the middle around the myosin, once those come together and the whole unit of the sarcomere gets shorter, that's showing that the sarcomere has fully contracted versus when the z-line comes out and there's more of those light colored areas on the outside that's when the muscle is fully relaxed okay so now we're going to get into these specifics of how does this whole process actually happen with the myosin heads binding to the actin forming these things called cross bridges that's when it actually binds and then it pushes the actin inwards to cause the tr contraction. How does all of that happen? I'm going to show a very useful video for helping you to visualize what is going on with the contraction of the sarcomeres. Muscle contraction is at the basis of all skeletal movements. Skeletal muscles are composed of muscle fibers which in turn are made of repetitive functional units called sarcomeres. Each sarcomere contains many parallel overlapping thin actin and thick myosin. Okay, notice how I kept saying and they said in the video that the actin filaments are thin, the myosin filaments are thicker. This is something that the IB does want you to mention as your, for example, outlining the process of muscle contraction. Filaments. The muscle contracts when these filaments slide past each other, resulting in a shortening of the sarcomere and thus the muscle. This is known as the sliding filament theory. Cross-bridge cycling forms the molecular basis for this sliding movement.
Muscle contraction is initiated when muscle fibers are stimulated by a nerve impulse and calcium ions are released. Okay, so there's step number one. A signal is received from a nerve impulse, and that is received just like how we learned in 6.5. Acetylcholine, right, the neurotransmitter, gets released, okay, and into the synaptic cleft between that neuron and the muscle cell. And then that acetylcholine is going to cause stimulation in the muscle cell that then causes the release of calcium by that specialized structure called the sarcoplasmic reticulum that I was that we were talking about before. So this calcium, this release of calcium, that's what triggers the whole muscle contraction to happen. So let's take a look and see how does it actually cause the contraction? How does the calcium cause this chain of events? The troponin units on the actin myofilaments are bound by calcium. Okay. Here we've got a couple new vocabulary words and structures that you're going to have to know about. Troponin is a protein that is on the actin filament. Okay, this purple stuff is the actin filament. Troponin is a protein on that actin filament. Okay, the calcium comes in and binds to that troponin. Okay, so that's why the calcium has to be released. Am I on? The binding displaces tropomyosin along the myofilaments. Okay, now you can see the chain of events that happens is first the calcium binds to the troponin. Then, as a result of that binding, tropomyosin, which is this string-like looking protein along the actin filament, actually moves and it exposes what? It exposes the myosin binding site, right, on the actin filament. That's these dark purple circle things that have just been exposed because the tropomyosin moved out of the way. Which in turn exposes the myosin binding sites. At this stage, the head of each myosin unit is bound to an ADP and a phosphate molecule remaining from the previous muscular contraction. The myosin heads release these phosphates and bind to the actin myofilaments via the newly exposed myosin binding site. Okay, so here we have the myosin heads that we were talking about earlier actually binding to the actin filament at the myosin binding site that was exposed by the tropomyosin. The two myofilaments glide past one another, propelled by a head-first movement of the myosin units, powered by the chemical energy stored in their heads. As the units move, they release the ADP molecules bound to their heads. Okay, so notice those actin heads are really important because that's what's really causing the action of the contraction. Once they bind to the actin filament at the myosin binding site, they actually contract and pull or push the actin inwards, okay? They're kind of throwing the actin inwards so that you have that contraction happening. The gliding motion is halted when ATP molecules bind to the myosin. By the way, that is the cross bridge formation where the actin, sorry, the myosin head binds to the actin. That's called the cross bridge formation and heads, thus severing the bonds between myosin and actin. The ATP molecules are now decomposed into ADP and phosphate. Feel free to watch that section again. Here we have the ATP. We're actually seeing how it's used in the muscles for contraction. So the ATP binds to the myosin head, right, and then releases it from the myosin binding site on the actin filament releases it so that it can then do the same thing over again and fully contract that sarcomere and do that again and push the actin further inwards. With the energy released by this reaction stored in the myosin heads ready to be used in the next cycle of movement, the myosin heads resume their starting positions along the actin myofilament.
and can now begin a new sequence of actin binding. The presence of further calcium ions will trigger a new cycle. Okay, so just a great animation that you can watch and rewatch if you want to remember what are the specific mechanics of how all of that works. Okay, and you do actually need to know how skeletal muscle contracts. And the detail that you need to know it in, I'm about to show on the next slide. So if you want to pause this and explain how the muscles contract based off what I've explained so far, go ahead and do that. And then I'm going to show the mark scheme, and you can check your answer with that. This is the answer and the detail that you need to know for the IV. Remember, you just need eight of these possible marks. So there are 15 possible marks, but you just need eight of those. Okay, last part of 11.2, you do need to know and be able to analyze the electron micrographs of the sarcomeres and be able to distinguish, is the sarcomere contracted? Are the muscles contracting or are they relaxed? The way that you can figure this out is by looking at the Z bands. Okay, so the H band is always going to look like that. That is the myosin, the thick myosin filaments that appear darker in the micrograph. And those are always going to stay the same because the myosin filaments stay the same length all the time, right? But it's the actin that gets pushed inward, right? That then appears as being contracted in the electron micrograph. And so if it's relaxed, you'll see a big light band right here a lighter color band before the z-line or next to the z-line but then as the muscle contracts that white or lighter band gets smaller 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 until the muscles fully contracted and then the z-line gets really close to that h band or the, the myosin filament 